I have titled this little talk, The Trump Card. Now in politics, we can always expect the unexpected. And uh, the world was certainly taken by surprise when Donald Trump won the American presidential election. Now in politics, we are taken by surprise, but in prophecy, we have certainty. And when we look at the prophetic picture of the book of Revelation, then we can see that there is a plan and there is a movement in a particular direction. And even though it looks confusing out there and sometimes doesn't work according to our expectations, the plan will be fulfilled according to the prophetic picture. In Revelation we read that the second beast, will form an image to the first beast. Now the first beast was identified by the Protestant world as the papal system and the second beast was looked at in the Protestant context and Wesley in his time expected that it would soon appear and the only one that fulfills all the criteria of the second beast is the United States of America that would make an image to the first beast. Now the first beast, as we know, was a politico-religious system that dominated world events and world affairs. And so the second system will be the same, where politics and religion will be mingled with each other and will elevate the first beast in the process. Now, that is what the prophetic scenario says. And sometimes when we look at events in history, it seems as though the exact opposite is happening. JFK said the following, I believe in an America where the separation of church and state is absolute, where no Catholic prelate would tell the president, should he be Catholic, how to act, and no Protestant minister would tell his parishioners for whom to vote, where no church or church school is granted any public funds or political preference, and where no man is denied public office merely because his religion differs from the president, who might appoint him or the people who might elect him. I believe in an America that is officially neither Catholic, Protestant, nor Jewish, where no public official either requests or accepts instructions on public policy, from the Pope, the National Council of Churches, or any other ecclesiastical source, where no religious body seeks to impose its will directly or indirectly upon the general populace or the public acts of its officials, and where religious liberty is so indivisible that in an act against one church is treated as an act against all. So Kennedy still stood for the absolute separation of church and state. Now if the prophecy is to be fulfilled, then this situation must change because the image must be like the original. And the original was church and state dictating morality to society. And so the second beast must, if it's to become an image, do exactly the same. Now, I believe one of the reasons why Kennedy disappeared from the scene and was assassinated was because he stood for these principles, besides other things that he did, like touch the Federal Reserve, etc. Now, under the two-party state in the United States, we seem to think that you are either voting for one system or another system. But that is, in fact, not the case. Quigley, who was... Uh, well, Bill Clinton's favorite professor said the following in his Tragedy and Hope. The argument of two parties should represent opposed ideas and policies, one perhaps of the right and the other of the left, is a foolish idea acceptable only to doctrinate and academic thinkers. Instead, the two parties should be almost identical so that the American people can throw the rascals out at any election without leading to any profound or extensive shifts in policy. The policies that are vital and necessary for America are no longer subject of significant disagreement, 
but are disputable only in details of procedure, priority or method. In other words, what he's saying is that the two-party system is there just to appease the populace, but the general direction will be the same. The puppet masters behind the scenes will still control events as they deem fit. Now, some of the puppets might not even know what is happening because the puppet master is in control. And sometimes even high officials can be misled or be thinking that they are doing one thing when they are actually propagating something else. Now, this is how the Hegelian dialectic works. If we have a look at a definition, it says it's a framework for guiding thoughts and actions into conflicts that lead to synthetic solutions which can only be introduced once those being manipulated take a side that will advance the predetermined agenda. Hmm. So there's controlled opposition, problem, reaction, solution. Now, this has been used for millennia in the political sphere. You create the crisis to induce the change, to bring about the direction that you really want everyone to go. But you have to swing the general mindset in a particular direction in order to get there. Now, Let's assume you want a particular religious agenda to be instituted and you know that secular society will not fall for that idea. S then you can bring in this dialectic and bring in an opposing view, bring in an opposite view which becomes totally unacceptable to the general populace, forcing them in a direction where they will eventually embrace that which you wanted all along, but had they remained middle of the road, they would never have accepted such a solution. So this is a, a method of mind control, mass mind control. Now when we look at the Obama legacy, then this becomes apparent. He's the one who said Trump is unfit to serve as president. And Donald Trump was using all the failures of the past administration to highlight his points. I mean, if you look at the entire world, it's in chaos. Refugees are streaming in all over. Bombs are exploding. ISIS is out of control. And all of these issues play on the minds of people and is herding them in a particular direction where they want to ensconce themselves and protect themselves from these waves of evil that are rolling in upon society and then perhaps doing exactly that which prophecy said they would do, which they would not normally have done had the circumstances been different. So what is the legacy of Obama and Hillary Clinton? Well, it is a liberal agenda. We have seen so many changes in society and so many laws being brought in where, well, a Christian morality seems to be decimated, nothing left of it, so that those that have a Christian ethic would want to scream out and say, we have to change this world. It can no longer carry on like this. And this is exactly what you do. You swing the pendulum to absolute liberalism in every sphere and then you let it go and let it swing to the other side so that you can get exactly what you want and what prophecy predicts. Obama is the one who said the future must not belong to those who slander the prophet of Islam. Now, if you look at the web pages, there's so much conjecture as to the, whether the man was perhaps a clandestine Muslim. And there are pictures of his ring, which tends to be Islamic, and there are pictures of, of him in uh, Islamic dress, and many, many statements to this effect. And if you look at the administration, many high officials are of the Muslim faith. So it seems as if America was being taken away from its Christian roots and swung in another direction. But prophecy said 
that the second beast, the United States of America, would implement legislation that would further the first beast, which is Catholicism. And therefore it must be a Christian nation bringing about Christian legislation. And here you had Obama taking the mindset in a totally opposite direction. This is a brilliant Hegelian dialectic. Whether he was, uh, whether he knew about what he was doing, whether he did it consciously, or whether he did it subconsciously is irrelevant. The fact of the matter is, this is what has happened. I believe, of course, that the insider elite is pretty clued up as to what the agenda is, but nevertheless, one can leave open the option that they might have done it unknowingly. But this was the legacy. And now, with the Trump administration, we are going to probably see the pendulum swing. Catholic Herald, Obama calls for world leaders to heed Pope Francis's message. The President of the United States said he wants fellow world leaders to reflect on Pope Francis' encyclical talking about the environment. So you have this you have this dichotomy of thought. On the one hand, you have this movement towards a totally different religious system, and on the other hand, you have this underpinning of the papal system. And under his leadership, you had the visit of Pope Francis, where he went through the entire procedure, almost like a president of the world being inaugurated, speaking from the balcony, which is a step higher than any of the presidents have done. So you have this dichotomy of thought. You have, on the one hand, the appearance that it's moving in this direction, and on the other hand, the realities of the laws that it's moving in another direction. And then you had the two opponents. You had the one standing for the principles of the right, the other one standing for the principles on the left, and it was a vicious campaign. Now, is this a dialectic, a Hegelian dialectic? Is this a game of good cop, bad cop, or two ideologies which are to undergo pendulum swing? Well, let's have a look at some of the facts without judging any of the individuals and see whether we can come up with some form of conclusion. Here we have the famous supper, the so-called charity supper that takes place just before uh, the election, where you have the Archbishop of New York, who always is the head of the Knights of Malta in America, where he has this meal with uh, the candidates that are to be elected for president. And you can see the jovial nature. This is church and state at its best. And the two of them smiling next to Cardinal Dolan. Now it's interesting when you look at the, the actions of these individuals, you also get this idea of this dialectic. I mean, if you take the cardinal, for example, the papacy will make one statement, a very conservative statement, let's say, with regard to uh, whatever, lifestyle choices or contraception. The papacy will make one, one statement, and the people who are supposed to live it out will do exactly the opposite. So you're confused. You're thinking, why? are the Jesuits and the Knights of Malta doing the exact opposite of what the papacy has just proclaimed? Why do you have this dichotomy of thought? Well, you see, in this thinking there's this yin-yang aspect. The white aspect and the black aspect, well, they augment each other. The one cannot exist without the other, so they say, in this yin-yang philosophy. So even within the ranks of the church, you have this dichotomy of thought. Now the two candidates, as we will see, fit the bill in every single aspect. If you go to the web pages and you look at the bloodlines of the American presidents, 
then it is a known fact that all the presidents that have, well, reigned in the United States have all been related. So let's have a look at what the media has to say. If all presidents are related, which of the 2017 candidates will be the next president? As it turns out, both Trump and Hillary Clinton are related to John of Gaunt, the 14th century royal. Gaunt was the first Duke of Lancaster, who was the son of King Edward III, according to my heritage. Trump is related through his mother, Mary Ann McLeod, back to his 17th grandfather, John Beaufort, while Clinton is related through her father and the Rodham family back to the 17th great-grandmother, Joan Beaufort. The two candidates are 19th cousins, and so they both have the right bloodlines to continue this lineage. Now, that's another story as to why they should all be related, and it's fascinating that the Bible doesn't speak about the presidents of the world, it speaks about the kings of the world. And uh, it really, over the course of history, hasn't mattered which of the candidates has won because the candidates have always both been in the same bloodlines. Uh, here are the American uh, presidential bloodlines. Here's another page that explains this. Did you know all 44 US presidents have carried European royal bloodlines into office? 34 have been genetic descendants of just one person, Charlemagne, the brutal 8th century king of the Franks. Now, that's a fascinating story, because Charlemagne is, of course, the one who was crowned emperor of the Roman Empire, the new Roman Empire, and the Pope was crowning him whilst his kingdom was falling apart. So he's a symbol of this unity of the world under one leadership, the papacy. And then if we go to Edward III of England, in fact, the presidential candidates with the most royal genes has won every single American election. Now, it seems as if Trump and Hillary had exactly the same uh, lineage, so it didn't really matter which one of the two won. This information comes from Burke's Peerage, which is the Bible of aristocratic genealogy based in London. Every presidential election in America since and including George Washington in 1789 to Bill Clinton has been won by the candidate with the most British and French royal genes. Of the 42 presidents, to Clinton, 33 have been related to two people, Alfred the Great, King of England, and Charlemagne, the most famous monarch of France. So it goes on, 19 of them are related to England's Edward III and has 2,000 blood connections to Prince Charles. The same goes with the banking families in America. George Bush and Barbara Bush are from the same bloodline, the Pierce bloodline, which changed its name from Percy when it crossed the Atlantic. Percy is one of the aristocratic families of Britain to this day. They were involved in the gunpowder plot to blow up Parliament at the time of Guy Fawkes. Now that's even more fascinating because that was a Jesuit plot to overthrow the Protestant government in the United States. So if all these bloodlines belong to these individuals that uh, overthrew Protestantism, well, that would be an interesting plot for the puppet masters to work on behind the scenes. But we're just looking at the facts, so let's continue. The Mail Online predicted or showed that the Simpsons predicted the Donald Trump presidency, and it didn't end well. Time travel episode from 2000 featured broke nation relied on aid from China. Now, as we have seen in some of the previous series that we have made, The Simpsons consist, well, the writers of The Simpsons are all probably insider individuals with uh, more knowledge about what is going to happen in the world than most would uh, deem possible. And uh, as some candidates have said in the past, if uh, something works out the way that it has worked out, it works out that way because it was planned that way. 
So there is that element, but there is also, of course, an element of, of luck, maybe, involved as well. Now, the Simpsons generally use many, many uh, esoteric symbols in their productions, and uh, they have been extremely accurate on a number of issues, and have predicted many, many things that seemed unlikely or impossible years in advance. 9-11 being a case in point, the destructive events in the United States, and in their particular little uh, issues, 16 years before this presidential election, they showed their character in the same dress as Hillary Clinton would be wearing, including the necklace, including the earrings, and that's rather fascinating. It's interesting that uh, she actually wins the next election, but according to their scenario, Donald Trump would win the current election. So that's rather fascinating, and some of the statements and the ideologies that were contrasted there are, well, very strange to say the least. Uh, this comes from the year 2000, and they show Trump in his red tie and his jacket between the flags, and this happened in reality. So they're, they're pretty accurate. But it gets even more bizarre because they show that Trump, that's in 2000, greeting the people in Trump Towers, going down the escalator, raising his hand, and again, he has the red tie and the suit on. And reality, 2015, Trump greeting the crowds, going down the escalator of Trump Towers. I mean, it's pretty accurate. It's pretty sharp. Now, whether this is pure coincidence or whether it is not is actually irrelevant. Some of the more bizarre ones, rather interesting, are the maps that we will see in a moment. And you can see their character here saying, oh no, it's actually come true. And this is the map that has been going around where they show what the, you know, the distribution of the votes would be. But this is actually not quite accurate because this one was actually one that they used in the Romney campaign, so it doesn't apply to that previous one. But nevertheless, it's interesting that they show these uh, red demographics, and of course this picture has changed in the present one, so you can not really use this one. Now let's have a look at some other facts, because what we are interested in is prophecy, and not the games and the dialectics that are being played in this world. The National Catholic Reporter tells us that Mike Pence, who is going to be the Vice President of the United States, which is a very, very powerful figure, is a born, again, evangelical Catholic. And uh, the web pages in the world tell us this very thing. Now, that's a, somewhat of a misnomer, and a few years ago, that would not have been a possibility to be a born again evangelical Catholic would be considered an oxymoron. It would be impossible. In my youth, that would have been impossible. But the religious landscape has changed, and there's been such a merging of Catholicism and Protestantism that uh, this contradiction in terms is today a common reality. So, a born-again evangelical Catholic. They say, that he was a rather dedicated Catholic, Mike Pence. He, went, he was an altar boy and uh, very dedicated. And what about uh, Donald Trump? Well, Donald Trump is an, attended an Ivy League school, so let's ask the Washington Post something about his background. When he was young, he went to the private Kew Forest School in Forest Hills, Queens, where his father Frederick, a very wealthy real estate developer, was on the governing board. Behavior problems led Donald's exit from the school, at which point he was sent to New York Military Academy at the age of 13 by his parents, and who hoped the discipline of the school would channel his energy in a positive manner. 
He did well there and went to Fordham University, a Jesuit school in the Bronx. So Donald Trump tries to downplay his Fordham experience and rather to upplay his later experiences. And uh, then he went to the University of Pennsylvania and studied economics for two years. So he did attend a Jesuit school, which is interesting and just one of the facts. Now let's go back to Mike Pence again, postmodern evangelical Catholic conservative. But Pence is also very much a creation of the ha last half century of America, American political religious life. Born and raised Catholic, he became a Catholic youth minister and reportedly wanted to be a priest. But according to interviews, Pence has given over the years, interestingly, he has more recently declined to talk specifically about his spiritual evolution. While in college from seven, 1978 to 81, he began blending his Catholicism with evangelical Protestantism. I made a commitment to Christ, Pence said. I'm a born again evangelical Catholic. So here we have a Catholic vice president who is in a position to reach out to evangelicals. Now it's fascinating that the other side, of course, had chosen Tim Kaine as their uh, vice president. And the two met in debate and apparently Mike Pence was the stronger candidate in that debate, or so they say, but nevertheless would have made any difference because both of these are Catholic gentlemen and let's have a look what the Harvard Divinity School tells us about Tim Kaine and Mike Pence and faith. It says that Kaine was educated at a Jesuit high school and has been influenced throughout his life by Jesuits. Often seen as progressive and open-minded in the US, he's also been called a Pope Francis Catholic. What does it mean to be a liberal Catholic reformer. Now this is rather fascinating. So you have these high profile Catholics as vice presidents, uh, the one wanting to be a priest and was an altar boy, and the other one all his training in Jesuit environments. Now it's interesting that uh, the Jesuits themselves say, or Ignatius Loyola said, that if uh, you have to choose sides, then a Jesuit can choose one side and represent it to the point of death, while a fellow Jesuit may choose the opposite side and uh, defend that to the point of death. That is the Hegelian dialectic, and it's fascinating how it works. So it really wouldn't have mattered which one of these two would have become the vice president, and it really wouldn't have mattered which one of these two would have become president. Now before I even talked about this, I, I thought that Hillary Clinton would probably fit the modern profile somewhat better, but I also said it doesn't matter which one of them wins. But now on reflection, it becomes rather interesting that it went the way it went. Now in the discussion here with these people from Harvard, uh, Donald Trump's running mate, Governor Mike Pence, described himself as a born-again evangelical Catholic. Is this an unusual faith mix? And what does this combination say about his public service? And the answer? I'm not quite sure what Governor Pence intends to affirm by a born-again evangelical Catholic. He comes from an Irish Catholic background, was raised as such during college, Indiana and Nova College. He had an evangelical religious experience under the influence of a non-denominational group. However, in the following years, he still considered himself a Catholic, went to Mass, worked as a youth minister at a Catholic church, and even thought of becoming a priest. However, in the mid-1990s, he joined the Grace Evangelical Church, which is affiliated with the Evangelical Free Church in America. One could describe it as a Baptist denomination. 
It was, however, the church to which he started to take his family in Indianapolis. At that time, he described himself as a Christian, conservative, Republican, in that order. In this description, the word Catholic was not present. So, when we look at these two, they are both capable of fulfilling the prophetic agenda. Pope Francis calls for unity between evangelicals, Catholics, and he said that division is the work of the devil. So they had to be brought together. So Pence is actually the perfect one because he is both Catholic and evangelical and can bring them together. Pope Francis has called for unity amongst evangelicals, Catholics and Christians from other denominations, emphasizing that we are one in Christ and warning that division between the groups is the work of the devil. It is the division is the work of the father of lies, the father of discord, who does everything possible to keep us divided, Francis said in a video message to a gathering sponsored by the John 17 movement. Now the John 17 movement was a movement to gather all the evangelicals under one umbrella under the papacy or together with the papacy. Charisma News gives a very interesting insight. It tells us that Kenneth Copeland laid hands on Donald Trump and prayed over him. This is fascinating. Well, Charisma News is a very prominent journal. Earlier this month, we reported how Paula White set up an invitation-only meeting between the Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump and evangelical pastors. That meeting happened this week and plenty of Pentecostals were there to lay hands on the billionaire, make declarations of his life and pray. Beyond Paula White, also present were Kenneth and Gloria Copeland. And then another whole host of very prominent evangelical leaders. Where is this heading towards? Are we heading towards a union of church? and state. Now, what is Donald Trump? Well, let's have a look. Religious News Services says, is Donald Trump now a born-again Christian? And when I, when I read uh, what the journal Christianity Today had to say about Donald Trump, about his remarks and his anti-woman statements and his, his wild statements, then they were, well, less than pleased, it seems. And now afterwards they're all scattering and trying to come together on these issues. Donald Trump has described himself as a Presbyterian and Protestant. A Sunday church person, which is very fascinating, and a collector of Bibles. Now the presumptive Republican presidential nominee reportedly can add born-again Christian to that list too according to one of the members of Trump's new Evangelical Advisory Board. So here you have a Sunday-keeping Protestant. Now, if you're going to reach out to the religious community and bring them together, wouldn't it be interesting if the Protestant reaches out to the Catholics and the Catholics reaches out to the Protestants? Then you would have a perfect mix. But uh, I found this rather interesting and an interesting mix because by some of his statements it is uh, hard to imagine that all of this is, you know, perfect truth. Now, this was the statement that Donald Trump made to the Catholic world. Catholics are an important part of the American story. America has been strengthened by hardworking Catholics. From New York to California, the Catholic story is truly unique, and it's a great story. From marching for civil rights to educating millions of children, serving the poor, and helping to find the pro-life movement, clergy and lay Catholics across the country have made countless contributions to the American success and the American success story. 
Washington politicians have been hostile to the church. They have been hostile to Catholics. They have been hostile to the members of Catholicism. My administration will stand side by side with the American Catholics to promote the values we all share as Christians and Americans. God bless you. God bless the United States of America. We will make America great again. So there you have Donald Trump reaching out to the Catholic community. A Protestant, born again Protestant. And on the other hand, you have Mike Pence, who said, I'm a Christian, conservative, and Republican in that order, and left out the little fact that he was thoroughly Catholic. Let's listen to what he had to say. Greetings, I'm Governor Mike Pence. You know, it's my honor this year to serve as the Republican nominee for Vice President of the United States with my running mate, Donald Trump. I'm grateful to be able to join you, if only by videotape, but I'm not sure how they introduce me. The introduction I prefer is pretty short. I'm a Christian, a conservative, and a Republican in that order. And really, it's as a fellow believer uh, that I'm particularly honored to be able to address you today. I know every one of us has our own story about how we came to faith. For me, I was raised in a family where faith was important. Church on Sunday, grace before dinner. But my faith became my own when I made a personal decision to trust Jesus Christ during the spring of my freshman year in college. That night, my heart was literally broken wide with gratitude and with joy when I came to realize that what happened on the cross in some small measure actually happened for me. And I know all of you in the room share that same passion and that same sense of gratitude for what was done on our behalf. Years later, my faith has been tested, relied on more times than I could possibly count. All I know for sure today is I need him more than ever. And he's really the center of my life and the center of my family's life. You know, God's love really eclipses our failings. And as always, He's been a source of renewal and strengthening for this nation and for people of faith throughout our history. In these troubled times, I believe we stand at a turning point when those who cherish faith, those who cherish freedom, those who cherish the sanctity of life and all the liberties enshrined in our Constitution should step forward and heed the call to action. I joined Donald Trump on the Republican ticket because I believe he has the right leadership and the right vision to make America great again. President Donald Trump will appoint justices to the Supreme Court who will uphold our Constitution and the rights of the unborn. Donald Trump will also sign into law legislation that will free up the voices of faith all across this country by repealing what's come to be known as the Johnson Amendment. The Johnson Amendment's literally been on the books since the 1950s, and it essentially threatens tax-exempt organizations and churches with losing their tax status if they speak out on important issues facing the nation from the pulpit. Donald Trump and I are both committed to work with re renewed Republican majorities in the House and the Senate to repeal the Johnson Amendment once and for all. You know, the truth is that a, a careful study of American history has shown that the strength of our nation has come from our communities of faith. Throughout our history, it's been the voices of faith that more often than not have driven our nation to a more perfect union. It was the pulpits uh, around the American founding that thundered against the tyranny of King George. It was the pulpits around America that spoke of the evils of slavery and brought an end to the scourge of slavery in America, even through a great civil conflict. And it was voices of faith and communities of faith that transformed our nation through the civil rights movement uh, in our own lifetime, and we're a better nation for it. The choice today for all of us, though, could not be more clear. I've never seen a more dramatic choice in a national election in my lifetime. I truly do believe we're, we're come to a time for choosing. And I think it's a time in the life of our nation when people who cherish life, when people who cherish our liberties, when she, people who cherish the great traditions that are enshrined in our Constitution should come together and support Donald Trump and our agenda to make America great again. In these troubled times at home and abroad, challenging times for American families, I'd, I'd like to encourage you to do one more thing, and that is to bow the head and bend the knee in the days that remain in this election. Pray for our country. But as you do so, please pray as, as Lincoln said was his prayer, 
Not so much that, that God would be on our side, but that we would be, in his words, on God's side. Because I truly do believe in my heart of hearts that what's been true for millennia is still true today. That if his people, who are called by his name, will humble themselves and pray, he'll again do as he's always done throughout the storied history of this nation. He'll hear from heaven and he'll heal our land. This one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to address you today. May God bless you, your families, this community of faith, your church, and may God continue to bless the United States of America. Would a speech like that make the pendulum swing to the other side? I think it could. Now what if there was a catch to it that nobody can really see? They can only see the negatives and the legacy of liberalism at the present time and the disasters that go along with it. And here is this hope of the pendulum swinging to the other side and embracing this promise of a healed land and a healed society. But what if it has an arrow embedded in it? A new America. You heard him say that Trump was going to repeal the Johnson Amendment that muzzles pastors. During his acceptance speech, Trump thanked the evangelical community for their support, adding, You have so much to contribute to our politics, yet our laws prevent you from speaking your minds from your own pulpits. An amendment pushed by Lyndon Johnson many years ago threatens religious institutions with the loss of their tax exempt status if they openly advocate their political views. I'm going to work very hard to repeal that language and protect free speech for all Americans. Let me take you back to the beginning of this little talk. What did JFK say? I believe in an America where no Pope and no Protestant prelate will tell the parishioners how to vote. And here we have a man who is saying that he will rescind the clause that makes it impossible for them to do so. Isn't this church and state coming together? Isn't this the clergy dictating to the parishioners views that will ensconce the values of Christianity? Now, if the values of Christianity were upheld, that would be a marvelous thing. But what if there were certain laws in that package that were actually laws of the first beast that the Protestant world had identified as Antichrist, and that these laws, when enacted, would negate the law of God. And the Bible says, they have done away with your laws. And it is time for you to act. I think we are living in very interesting times. Now, the journal Politico says, Trump Evangelical Advisory Board features Backman and Fol Jerry Falwell. So he has an advisory board that is going to advise him on policy. Now, what did JFK say? Where no Protestant prelate will tell the President of the United States what he should do, and no Pope. And now we have a mixture of the two doing exactly that. Now, will it favor the first beast, Catholicism? Let's have a look. Well, here is the full list of the board members as shared by the campaign. Now, we won't go through all of them, just highlight one or two of them and see where this leads us. There's Michelle Backman, former congresswoman, and there's Bernard, senior pastor and CEO of uh, Christian Cultural Center. There's Mark Burns, Tim Clinton, and then there's Kenneth and Gloria Copeland. Now, these are very interesting people that have made some fascinating statements in the past 
which are mind-boggling when you compare them with what the Bible has to say. And uh, you have James Dobson, author, psychologist and host of My Family Talk, Jerry Falwell, president of Liberty University, you had Ronnie Floyd and Jack Graham and many others. And you have Robert Jeffries and Davis Jeremiah and Richard Land and James MacDonald and Johnny Moore and Robert Morris. This is the full team. James Robinson, founder of Life Outreach International. Tony Suarez, Executive Vice President, National Hispanic Christian Leadership Conference. Jack Strack, Paula White, Tom Winters, Celia Yates. I mean, this is fascinating. And what did Donald Trump say about these people? He said, I have tremendous respect and admiration for this group. And I look forward to continuing to talk about the issues important to evangelicals and all Americans and the common sense solutions I will implement when I am president. Donald Trump said of his list that included former Congresswoman Michelle Bachman. Now, let's have a look at just one or two on that list. In 2014, a group of evangelicals was taken to the Vatican by Tony Palmer, who is now deceased, and there they were to embrace uh, each other so that the evangelicals and the Catholics could come together again. It was on that occasion, or just prior to that, where the Pope had sent a message to Kenneth Copeland, and Kenneth Copeland had blessed the Pope while speaking in tongues. And there were many other evangelical leaders there that also embrace the papal message that was sent to them. Pope Francis met televangelist Kenneth Copeland and James Robinson. Now, both of those are on the list. So this is rather fascinating. These people went to Rome to discuss the reunification and this event is going to be very prominent and public in the year 2017 when the Lutheran world celebrates its 500th centennial of the Protestant Reformation. So these are the issues of the day. The Christian Poth says megachurch pastor Jack Graham ready to champion Donald Trump after meeting with 900 evangelicals. Now he's also one of those that went to the Pope. Former Southern Baptist Convention president and mega church pastor Jack Graham says that he is ready to champion Donald Trump after attending the meeting between the presumptive Republican nominee and over 900 evangelical pastors and activists in New York City on Tuesday. These people are on the one hand now the advisors to the president and to bring about this change, this making America great again. And on the other hand, they are the ones who are negotiating with the papacy for reunification. In fact, that is exactly what Donald Trump vowed to do. Donald Trump vowed to close the gap between church and state, according to time. And it states that the GOP presidential nominee has tripled down with one base of political support that has steadfastly remained with him, white evangelical voters, by promising to dismantle the laws that separate church and state in America. Now it's fascinating what he said on the issue. And if you look what happened to religion, if you look at what's happening to Christianity, and you look at the number of people going to the churches, and the evangelicals know this also, it's not on this kind of climb, it's on this kind of a climb of slow and steady in the wrong direction, Trump said. A lot of it has to do with the fact that you've been silenced. You've been silenced like a child has been silenced. You have a chance to do something that will be earth-shaking, he said. I literally mean it, earth-shaking. You've got to get your people out to vote. Now, if this is what Donald Trump promised, 
But then he is promising precisely what the Bible said would happen. An earth-shaking event that will induce God to intervene in human affairs. It's interesting that both Donald Trump and Pence said that they cherished the Sunday because that was part of their heritage and that is what they remember of their childhood. Now the Lord's Day Alliance and the Boston Globe said the following. The Lord's Day Alliance, founded by six major Protestant denominations in 1888, I find these dates so fascinating, spent a century fighting to force industrialists to give workers time to attend religious services and later to protect the blue laws. Those are the ones that bring in Sunday legislation. But little by little, drinking, sporting, shopping became permissible on Sundays. In the last 20 or so years, the group has shifted to advocating to an internal recognition of the Sabbath. The point is, where can a stressed out society find regeneration and renewal? Said Reverend Rodney Peterson, executive director of the group, who drew dozens of people to an interfaith conference on Sabbath observance last week at the Old South Church in Copley Square. So this was reported in the Boston Globe on November the 2nd, 2016. This is an evangelical agenda to bring Sunday back into the mainstream again. And here we have candidates, I believe, that are in a position and have the power base to do it. Because for the first time, Republicans control both houses. This is one of the most powerful presidents that the United States has ever had. And if ever there was an opportunity to bring about the prof prophetic scenario, it is now. I'm not saying it will happen. I'm saying it is possible for it to happen. Revelation 13 verse 15 says, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast and that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Is this the time in which this prophecy will be fulfilled? Only time will tell.